<clears throat> we're on it's just loading um Okay, I think if you just give it a minute or two, you should be all right to start. Okay, I'm going to start. Okay? okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to welcome Patrick Rickles to our e-conference this afternoon. Patrick is Head of Business Intelligence and Spatial Data Science for HM Courts and the Tribunal Service. He's also Deputy Head of Diversity and Inclusion for the, geography, the Government Geography Profession, which is a, a wonderful new invention in government. Patrick is a GIS specialist who worked for some time at ESRI before moving formally into government. He now develops geospatial data sets to support decision making and creates innovative mapping and geovisualization products. Our understanding of geography in government is very sketchy, so I'm delighted that Patrick can lift the lid on how geography really matters at the heart of the civil service. Patrick, uh, we, we have, we're very delighted that you're talking to us. If people have any questions, then please write them um, on chat in YouTube and uh, you will take the questions later on this afternoon. So welcome and thank you very much. Great, thank you, Jill. And uh, thank you everybody for having me. It's a pleasure to be here virtually. <laughs> um, my name is Patrick Rickles, uh, as, as introduced, and uh, I'm gonna take you through a, a presentation on uh, geography and government, uh, give you a little bit about my background, kind of how I got here, um, and a bit on what I do in my immediate role, as well as what I do in my wider role as one of the deputy heads for um, the geography profession. So a little bit about my history and why I'm here. I uh, thought I'd start off with a picture. This is me at the uh, Esri User Conference in 2015 uh, in, in San Diego. Had a lot of fun going there. Uh, for that conference, I was the um, recipient of the ESRI Young Scholars Award and representative for the United Kingdom. Um, you can tell by my accent, I'm not originally from here, so uh, it, that wasn't a requirement. <laughs> uh, but for that, uh, it, it, was, it was a real honor to go there. Uh, I've had a bit of a hodgepodge career that kind of got me to there and got me to here. Um, but to give a bit of an idea of my background, I started in computer science in Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, I originally wanted to make video games. And then through my studies, I ended up taking a few courses in environmental science, uh, really enjoyed how you can monitor and measure information. Um, and I was, I was a bit torn. Do I stay in computer science? Do I go into environmental science? And then I ended up taking a course on geographic information systems and, and that was it. And, uh, the rest is history, really. <laughs> um, I, I finished my studies actually doing a dual degree in computer science and environmental science, and then went on to do a master's at UCL in geographic information science. But then from there, having had that academic background, I really wanted to see all the different ways that we could apply GIS in a practical way. And so um, I, I finished my courses, and I went into getting a job um, initially at oil and gas. Uh, I then moved on to working for Esri for a bit, doing software engineering and defense contracting for the US government. Uh, and then after that, I, I kind of missed the UK, very much missed the UK and wanted to move back. So I came back here and I started working for a company called WSP Group that focuses on engineering and construction. While there, I um, contributed to projects around uh, urban planning, um, transportation planning, environmental remediation. So really just, got to experience a variety of different things, which was really exciting. Um, but web geospatial programming was something that ended up being a golden thread through my career. And eventually I wanted to see if I could try my own hand at my own uh, consulting company. So I created my own company for a bit. 
uh, contracting to a variety of different um, organizations. But there was something that still drew me back to uh, exploring the greater mysteries of geography and GIS. And so uh, I'd always kind of wanted to do a PhD. Um, I ended up finding really great opportunity at UCL and then went back there and did a um, part-time PhD while being a full-time research associate. So while working there, uh, I, had some, I had the pleasure of working on some really interesting projects. Uh, the first one was called Adaptable Suburbs, where we looked at how uh, four suburbs around London changed over time. It was a very interdisciplinary project. You'll sort of notice a theme to my career here. Um, that involved architects and historians uh, and GI scientists where we were analyzing road networks, uh, footfall of traffic, diversity in buildings and um, building floor plans, uh, businesses even. Uh, and that, that provided some really insightful uh, understanding into keystone businesses that have existed across various time periods in those communities. And then moving on, I worked in a, on a project called Challenging Risk, which looked at how to positively impact earthquake and household fire preparedness in particular communities. Uh, our area of study was actually Seattle, Washington, where we worked with um, local communities taking a participatory action research approach uh, to facilitate workshops and build um, applications um, to help communities. We, and, and the communities defined this uh, by the way, but the, um, we helped to facilitate these workshops to build a prototype app to collect information on uh, whether people had seven to 10 days worth of food and water at a particular location, whether they had an ax, a ladder, a toolbox, and really to help figure out who was more prepared where and provide that information to the offices of emergency management in Seattle, again, with the consent of the community. But as I had the chance of working with all these really interesting projects, what, um, what was really interesting and also difficult to see was that these brilliant researchers from social psychology and structural engineering and history and architecture had uh, difficulty with actually learning GIS. And so I ended up basing my PhD research around how can we positively impact and improve the learning experience for interdisciplinary researchers when they were learning GIS. Um, and my research kind of ended up uh, focusing on three particular strands, one of which was the particulars around interdisciplinary research itself, um, some of the challenges that are unique to interdisciplinary research, some suggested solutions to those things, uh, equally looking at um, educational approaches. So I ended up focusing on uh, approaches that were, would fall into the realm of context-based learning. And then as far as GIS is concerned, uh, trying to frame and understand those concepts that were of interest to those interdisciplinary researchers, which using the geographic information science and technology body of knowledge were concepts that were mostly engaged with were from analytical methods. So how to analyze data, geospatial data, how to collect and store data and cartography and visualization. So how to visualize the information once you've made it. Uh, I could probably go on for another, 30, 40 minutes, um, just specifically about my research. Ask, a, ask somebody who's done their PhD about their research and they could probably yammer on for a while, uh, but I'll leave it at that. Um, at the very least, having spent a fair bit of time in academia, I started getting itchy feet again and wanted to see if I could move on to something else. Now, having worked in private sector and academia, I'd never actually worked purely in public sector, just contracting to it. And so I thought, you know what? I'd like to try my hand working in public sector. And I was successful in a position at the Ministry of Housing, Communities, and Local Government to really get to understand how civil service worked. Uh, while I was in my role there, I did, uh, I did some work on actually helping to unlock the opportunities of spatial data sets that were there. A lot of information, and I've seen this quite regularly happen across government, a lot of information is stored in spreadsheets, and it's tabular information that talks about different areas or different regions. And the, this information could actually be visualized on a map, but um, because it's considered too difficult uh, or they might not have access to the, the necessary technology, they end up not uh, really engaging with the opportunities that are there for spatial data. So I ended up doing a lot of um, programming for pipelining the information using VBA and Python. Uh, you work with what you've got really. 
to then take these data sets, uh, zip them up, upload them into ArcGIS online, start to publish them out using the Esri's Living Atlas, and have those as de facto geospatial data sets that the department served out and still serves out to this day. Uh, but then afterwards, I moved on to working for HM Courts and Tribunal Service, which is where I'm currently at. Uh, the majority of my role is still around uh, visualizing information. Uh, I use GIS, uh, but I also use a tool called Microsoft Power BI, visualizing KPIs and uh, bar charts, um, line graphs, scatter graphs, you name it, visualizing information in an understandable way to audiences and picking those uh, appropriate methods to visualize that information. And I draw a lot upon my background in cartography as well to advise on uh, color science theory principles, UX, UI design, and laying out information, how people understand things based on, for example, Nielsen's F pattern, where we read across the top first, then down the next line, and then down the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and leading on geospatial analyses, which uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail on one of the types of analyses that we do in HMCTS. Uh, but that's so that's one of my roles. And um, another one of my roles, like as I mentioned, I'm one of the deputy heads of the geography profession, with my specific focus being on diversity and inclusion. And I'll talk about that in the second half of my presentation. But to tell you a little bit more about HM Courts and Tribunal Service, because generally speaking, when I mention that, people they're like, huh, what's that? <laughs> uh, it's actually an executive agency that sits underneath the Ministry of Justice. Uh, and a big part of my role is actually revolving, re revolves around what's known as a reform program. So Ministry of Justice has invested over a billion pounds into updating its infrastructure. Uh, this includes uh, courts, so HM probation and prison services, courts uh, and, and the other agencies that sit underneath it. Um, when I came in and still a bit to this day, and this is something that we're moving away from, you would have the situation where evidence is submitted that would then be copied, photocopied in triplicate with packs that were sent to the defense, a pack that was sent to the prosecution and another pack that was sent to the judiciary. And really we needed to move away from that, centralizing the data in digital ways and then presenting that information using modern platforms that offer more security, uh, easier ways of disseminating the information. And so that's ultimately what the reform pro program is trying to go towards. Uh, to give you a bit of an idea on HMCTS itself, we have over 300 properties around the country. This is largely our courts, video hearing uh, sites, uh, probation service sites, things of that nature. And uh, we have over 20,000 employees that are employed specifically within HMCTS. So uh, first and foremost, we answer to the judiciary, uh, so the judges of the country. Um, and we also employ analysts like myself. Uh, we have court clerks and court ushers, all of which are employees of HMCTS. And there are thousands of cases heard across jurisdictions. So jurisdictions like Crown and Magistrates, uh, civil and family courts, uh, as well as various tribunals that are focused on social security and child care support, immigration and asylum seeking claims, employment tribunals, and, and similar. Uh, but so really we've got all this stuff and there are questions that are asked um, quite regularly that are actually inherently spatial questions. So for example, uh, are our current locations still providing value for money? You know, would it be more cost effective to buy new properties um, or build new properties? And then, you know, based upon either buying or building those new properties, selling or uh, selling off older properties or moving away from those older properties, you know, as people go to those different places, as staff get employed by those different places, you know, how would that change workloads? And really, that's something that uh, as a GI scientist, I'm, I can advise on. That's something that's used across different industries. It, I believe in marketing, it's called a, a market cannibalization analysis. Retailers use it all the time to figure out where to put the next Walmart or Asda or something like that. Um, so we can use similar methodologies in courts and tribunals and across various government departments. So to just give you a little bit of a flavor of um, the travel time analyses that I do around that, uh, to, to answer those sorts of questions. We largely use uh, Google Maps API currently. That's something that I want us to move away from, uh, particularly because of transparency issues and the inability to um, store data for as long as we would like to store it for. Uh, but the, the calls that we make to the Google Maps application programming interface uh, API, we initially wrote in Python, uh, then we redeveloped it in R because there was a little bit more um, 
expertise in R as a programming language uh, throughout the team. So it meant that, that whatever was developed could be sustained beyond a single developer, then moving on to another position. And we had to write the code in a particular way that would chunk the processing. Uh, so in case there were any network timeouts or any VPN droppings, uh, we wouldn't, you know, then pick up at a different point and miss out on certain records. So what we're doing with this is using postcode to postcode to figure out how long it would take from somebody to get from their postcode to uh, the postcode of the uh, court. And we would do that analysis using uh, we do that analysis doing drive time calculations as well as uh, public transport uh, calculations too. But then once we'd actually get this information, and this was before I came in, it would largely be analyzed in Excel and then reported in Excel charts, uh, spreadsheets, um, some bits copied into Microsoft Word, uh, possibly copied into PowerPoint. And uh, there wasn't really an involvement of GIS to begin with, which uh, was, a, was an opportunity missed. So that was something that I really wanted to change. And, and I have changed a bit as we moved on. Uh, there were some general challenges. And I think these are general challenges that affect a lot of different government departments, which were around you know, non-experts tweaking or changing some of the settings. If we left it a, we, you know, if we're looking at a travel time analysis saying if we're leaving at 9 a.m., well, what if we were to change it to 9.30? How would that actually affect certain things? And really for the government geography profession, we're trying to standardize how we uh, do those okay. sorts of analyses, making sure that the parameters are set up properly. And then infrastructure can regularly be an issue if we don't have the necessary digital um, infrastructure in place that would allow us to analyze, uh, analyze networks, store the data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, oftentimes we see a lack of prioritization of this kind of work. We recognize that it's medium to high impact but then it ends up being um, a low priority because of other work that might be going on or because it hasn't been embedded in the organization. They really don't know how it could possibly benefit. We have people who move on quite regularly in civil services is often called churn. And there are different areas and different departments that are doing things that aren't aware of other areas doing the same thing. So we need to work on our internal communication, uh, be more connected in the things that we do, and make sure that we all share the costs and the benefits. Uh, so to share uh, the output um, from the location assessment tool that used some of those travel time calculations, we were we assigned those um, travel time calculations to local authorities to be able to assess um, uh, to assess commutability scores based on whether it would take somebody to drive 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes to the centroid of the local authority uh, based on various locations. Uh, and this is largely to see where would be ideal to build new uh, courts and tribunals, service centers, or CTSCs. And, um, and, and for this, we can kind of see that based upon the, the categorization uh, using a simple core pleth map and an online map that allows people to zoom in, zoom out, click on various polygons to actually see um, see information associated with that local authority. Newcastle upon Tyne might be a really good area based on that 30 minute commutability score to create a new CTSC. And so this is a way of actually dynamically interacting with information, serving this out to people and was really well received by the organization. They didn't even know that this was possible. And now that it's possible, they're asking for more stuff. Uh, to talk about something a little bit more related with uh, what's going on right now, um, everybody is affected by COVID-19 and government departments are trying to do what they can to uh, help to get information out there to the public. And a lot of geospatial analyses are being done uh, across departments. Uh, again, coming back to the example of HM Courts and Tribunal Service, which we're not a you know we're not a big organization, but we are doing an important function for the country. Uh, we initially had uh, our various courts around the country and serving that information out to say which ones are still open to the public, which ones are staff only, and which ones are currently suspended. And that information was released as an Excel spreadsheet put up on gov.uk, but it was considered very difficult for the general, popu the general populace to understand uh, whether courts were actually closed or not, because we've got certain nuances with courts. A particular location, for example, Worcester uh, Combined Court is actually a combination of the of Worcester Crown Court and Worcester County Court. And it may be the case where Worcester Crown is still open to the public, but Worcester County is suspended. And then so how do we communicate that information? 
So I've ended up taking our various courts and creating a and created a um, traffic light system, red, amber, green, regularly called um, system for the various points, showing that on this map, bright green means that that particular court and the courts inside of that location are open to the public. Uh, a little bit of a lighter green is a combination of open to the public and uh, staff only yellow being staff only, orange being staff only or suspended, and then red being the courts that are suspended. Uh, this is a great proof of concept. We'll um, hopefully, fingers crossed, be releasing this soon and embedding it on gov.uk for people to use and have access to. So enough about me. Uh, more importantly, moving on to the government geography profession itself. Uh, so the geography profession was, uh, and again, this is my second job, if you will. Um, the government geography profession was established in 2018. There was always a need to actually establish this kind of profession. Um, there's a lot of excitement around it, got a lot of support for it. And so again, established in 2018. Uh, and within the past two years time, we've grown to over 1200 members, which we're absolutely excited about. In the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a picture of David Wood, who's our head of profession and helps to lead us with regard to the vision of what we're trying to achieve. Um, so inside of public sector to explain a little bit, uh, you know, we, we are open to civil servants, crown servants and public servants. Um, we are all over the place doing everything that we can to help serve the public. And a profession acts as a way to support people in their skills, professional development and establish career pathways for people to pursue. Uh, but so to explain a little bit more about the professions themselves, there are a variety of different professions across government. Um, the, our, main, our four main professions generally tend to be recognized as government statistical services, government operational research services, um, government social research services, and government economic service, which will focus on different things. So um, GSS statistics, they focus on statistics, statistical analyses. Um, operational research is looking to see how we can improve efficiencies um, and get management gains. Social research is looking into uh, the social side of things, particularly around like qualitative surveys and uh, interviews um, to gather information on a more, uh, again, qualitative level. And then economic services, we've got economists that are looking at different models to see how things are growing or shrinking. Um, but then there are a, a variety of different other services that are out there as well. Um, government so science and engineering is another one uh, that acts as a umbrella service, if you will, that the geography profession has actually established itself under. Uh, you can probably see in the bottom left corner, we've got our geography logo, and we've also got a little bit through GSC because we are a part of them. And these professions, again, help to build expertise of an analysts and interested parties across government. We provide um, support for people's careers and career progression, and really want to ensure that as parts, as being parts of professions, we hold ourselves to a code of ethics and certain standards for the outputs that we deliver. So our vision in particular for the geography profession is to create and grow a high profile, proud and effective geography profession that attracts fresh talent and has a secure place at the heart of government decision-making. And we're realizing this vision through three main pillars, which is initially looking at how to create an environment for geographers to maximize their impact in government. Again, raising the profile of what we're doing in our various government departments uh, and embedding geography into policymaking, into analyses, letting people know that it is there. The next professionalizing geography in government science and engineering, uh, which we've done some great work there. Um, positively affecting the framework of government science and engineering, uh, the, uh, the analysis function, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, and opening up opportunities for geographers. And then of course, continuing to grow the community. So providing professional outreach, uh, networking events, um, and, uh, and uh, focusing on diversity and inclusion. Uh, so making sure that it's a profession that's open to everybody from a variety of different backgrounds. So to talk a little bit about the analysis function, you can kind of see that based on all those different professions, there's a, there's a bit of overlap. You'll have economists that are gonna be doing some st statistical analyses, and it's not to say that they need to belong to one profession or the other. People can belong to multiple professions. If there's a plurality of skills that people are looking for, then it may be the case that a job that might be advertised would be advertised to multiple professions or analysts from multiple professions. And so the analysis function is actually trying to establish that core 
uh, functionality for analysts to come together. And then it's not to say that people couldn't still be a part of statistics or part of geography. Uh, we still have those niche services that we offer, but this, in, this acknowledges that there are core analytical services that we offer across the different professions and to bring us together and make sure that we're a little bit more connected. And geography has been feeding into this very heavily establishing uh, certain key roles that we do around analysis, uh, management and coordination functions and uh, geospatial data. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that we work very closely with the Geospatial Commission. The Geospatial Commission was established a few years ago uh, to help unlock the potential of geospatial data across government. Uh, there's some great work that's going on there. I highly recommend checking them out if you're not aware of what they've been doing, but they're helping to connect up geospatial efforts across government departments as well. And they've provided us a great amount of support and we've also provided them as experts in the field feedback and how they can do uh, how they can act impactful programs that can positively benefit everybody across the across geography. Uh, so to talk a little bit more about the professional leadership team, I'm one of a number of different deputy heads uh, with um, hopefully decent quality pictures of the deputy heads that we have there. David would get in the center as our head of uh, as our head of geography. But you can see from the different people who are deputies that we have representation across a variety of different departments, the Department for Environment, Farming and Rural Affairs, uh, the Department for International Development, Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, Office for National Statistics, Ministry of Defense, Environment Agency and Ordnance Survey. And so, as I mentioned, we currently have over 1,200 members uh, across public sector and growing. Um, and just showing the, the current chart of membership, you can see most of our members. We have over 350 members alone that are part of DEFRA. Uh, that also includes the sub-agencies of, uh, for example, Natural England and the Environment Agency. Ministry of Defense is in second with uh, what looks to be about 230 members and uh, and so on and so forth down the line. Uh, you can also see that we have great representation from uh, in, uh, local government in England, uh, Scottish government, Welsh, Welsh government, as well as Northern Ireland government. And so when people sign up for the geography profession, we ask them what their topics of interest are, what brings them to uh, geography. And based upon the, the various texts that people would input to say why they're interested in geography. We kind of made a, a little a little wordle here to talk about the things that they were interested in. And of course, front and center, we can see geography and GIS. But there are other things that are worth mentioning here that we can see that if we look around, uh, you can see that people are talking about physics and epidemiology, very relevant right now. Uh, artificial intelligence, 3D, soil, uh, and marine, for example. So it just kind of shows that we're not just doing map making or we're not just GIS people in government. We're doing a variety of different things, engaging with a variety of different topics. It comes back to that idea and that understanding of interdisciplinarity and where geo can provide benefit. So it was really great to see this uh, as, a, as a bit of a visual output. And similarly, uh, we also collect information on people's uh, positions across government. And again, we can see kind of front and center manager and officer, um, but we also have advisors, analysts. And what this ends up showing to us is that we have uh, people who are working in junior as well as senior positions that are part of the geography profession that are doing geographical work. And it's great to see that plurality across government departments, as well as again, from those junior and senior positions. So we've got a diverse, uh, a diverse pool of members and offering for the civil service from the geography profession. As I continue to mention, diversity and inclusion is extremely important to us. We want to make sure that we provide opportunities for all and for all of our members. Uh, we piggyback off of some of the some existing programs that are out there. So, for example, the RGS's Geography Ambassador Program, their Race, Culture and Equality Working Group, which we have representation on and we're a part of. Um, and we're trying to, again, continue to widen profession or widen participation and participate with other diversity and inclusion initiatives, uh, government science and engineering, as well as the analytical function or analysis function, rather. Um, we have representation on their diversity and inclusion working groups. Uh, we also um, we also help to recommend to our members and 
suggest to them that they get involved with the Positive Action Pathways Program, which is a program within government to help support building uh, leadership and management skills for people from, um, from Black, Asian, minority, ethnic backgrounds, uh, people from the LGBTQ plus community, uh, people with disabilities, women, people with caring duties. Uh, we want to see civil service be more representative of society. What also really helps us is that we have departmental senior um, management champion, senior management champions, uh, people who are really trying to uh, pave the way for people to help open up opportunities and make sure that uh, people's voices are heard. And I'm pleased to say as well, based on some of the demographic information that we can get from our members, uh, that over 40% of the geography profession members identify as female, and we're hoping to continue to increase those numbers, particularly to make sure that we have an appropriate gender balance, a representative gender balance uh, within our profession. So a bit about who we are. Um, this is uh, just a screenshot from the I am a geographer page at uh, the on the Royal Geographical Society uh, website. Highly recommend checking it out if you get a chance and filtering just specifically on public sector. We have a number of people who have contributed profiles. Uh, we have a few of our deputy heads of the profession. So Claire Hadley uh, from Ordnance Survey, Ian Spencer from Ministry of Defense and Ian Cody from Department for International Development. But we've got a few other people here and what you can kind of see is that uh, we're doing a lot of different things from geomorphology by uh, Richard Jeffries to uh, we're looking at um, flood and risk management by Jessica Prest. So we've got, and, and even uh, the EU exit policy from Maria. So we, we, we are really doing a lot of different things in a lot of different departments. Geography is, is really helping out where it can do. And it's just a matter of getting that story out there of what we can do and how we can help. So to talk about some more specific examples across different departments, uh, we do have the um, winners of the 2019 Geographers and Government Award, which I've got a few links if you wanted to explore so, a bit around um, those award winners. But just to give you an idea of the different categories that we had and the type of work that the, our winners did, which was just really, really incredible stuff. Um, one of our categories, our first category was Advancing Geospatial Data Science. And the winners of this category was uh, the, the spatial analysis team from the Office for National Statistics. Uh, they did some great stuff with establishing a global metric that can be used as an indicator for 911. This addresses uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. They, they uh, workshopped and built this framework and it was so successful uh, with understanding how quickly 911 services could be rolled out to urban as well as rural populations that it's now become part of one of the uh, UN standards and it's been rolled out globally um, to a, a number of different uh, countries. So it's great to see that work and it's great to see that British government has led the way on that. Uh, with the category of operational delivery, we have the winner from that category was Ben Payne from Natural England, uh, who is looking at how we could better survey and collect information on the Great Crested Newt, uh, how we could then look at different um, translocation programs and to cut costs and to increase the numbers of that animal species population and provide benefit to the department. Uh, moving then down into excellence in geo visualization and cartography, uh, it was this was really cool stuff. Uh, the winners of that category were from uh, Ordnance Survey, uh, particularly the, they work on the platform Open Zoom Stack, which is a 3D web GIS platform where we can see various building heights. Um, it's really, really cool, very responsive, fast to use. Uh, so they, they were, it, it was great to see them working in that space. Uh, then moving on to impact on policy, uh, our winner there was Jamie O'Donnell from Department for Transportation, who created a web GIS platform that could serve out information on major road networks, uh, the various segments to be able to understand planning permissions and uh, whether changing some of those segments or dropping out some of those segments could potentially affect decision making. And then finally coming on to the contribution to the profession, the winners from that category from the Defense Geographic Center who uh, their work was focused on how to improve training materials, improve our framework of professionalism for geography uh, within Ministry of Defense. And then later on, we've used that to uh, inform the profession as well as to pass that on to geospatial commission and the analysis function. So 
all of them are doing really great stuff. We've got the awards this year as well that have been pushed back because of the situations that are happening now, but uh, we are regularly hosting our award ceremonies and uh, a number of other things that are associated with our benefits to membership. So uh, we do wanna make sure that we provide impact to our members. Uh, and in particular, we want to have a vibrant community uh, as I mentioned before, we've got over 1,200 members. We have a Slack channel. We have um, monthly webinars that we host. We have a newsletter that goes out monthly to let people know about various events, things that are going on, um, important news to broadcast based upon what our members want to share uh, more widely. We have our annual conference, which this past year was attended by over 250 people. Uh, many thanks to the sponsorship for that from um, the various organizations. And uh, we have and we have our annual awards. Again, our second one's coming up soon. Um, we try and promote the profession where we can, having external events that we attend, uh, such as various conferences, uh, engaging with universities, uh, secondary schools, primary schools as well. We wanna get them young. <laughs> and then providing mentorship to our members um, as, they, as they grow in their careers, using the framework, uh, the frameworks that have been established by other organizations, including government science and engineering. And then as we continue to grow, we want to grow our offering as well. Um, we're starting to develop topic notes, um, particularly to provide guidance and best practices to our geographers. Uh, we've just recently been involved with the update to the Government Magenta book. And uh, we've got more that's coming soon. <laughs> uh, again, making sure that we keep people up to date on what's going on, feeding more into the government analysis function, and then promoting geography and geographic thinking everywhere that we can, letting government departments know and our seniors know how we can provide impact to the work that we're trying to achieve across all government departments. And so that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you everybody for listening. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions now if we've got any. Fantastic, uh, Patrick. Thank you so much. There, you. There, are, there are some questions. Um, sure. Can I just go back? Let's just go back to the promotion bit. Sure. And, and you actually mentioned pupils and students and, and so on, how you get the word out to schools. So there have been some questions about to what extent should GIS be taught as a skill in schools? And particularly concerning that the computer science um, is, is not actually happening in schools anymore. So um, really GIS has only been covered in any depth or any sense of it in geography. But mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, are you concerned about that lack of um, expo exposure in schools? Uh, I am, yes. In particular, you know, if we think about the changes that were made to the national curriculum a few years ago, key stage three and four, and having, having GIS as part of that, uh, you know, what we do want to be sure of is that if things are said that we follow up on them. So if that is part of the national curriculum, we should be making sure that students have those sorts of opportunities. Um, and I, I recognize that there, uh, you know, there, there is a, a digital divide. There are certain resources that may or may not be available to students. And, and that's something that, um, you know, I, I can't specifically comment on. But uh, it's great to see that there are organizations that are out there that are trying to provide those resources. Mm -hmm. We know that the RGS is providing resources uh, as far as educational materials are concerned. I know that there are some that are available through the Geographical Association. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, actually, in particular, interesting that this is mentioned, um, we know that there are a lot of people who are working from home, their kids are at home. We want to make sure that people are, that, that the children are still learning. And so we're actually compiling training resources that are available um, uh, across a variety of different platforms for learning and for teaching and for learning about geography. So yeah, I think that that's really important. It should be there. We should provide those opportunities. I think there's more that we can do in that space. Um, and that's something that, you know, again, through centrally through the government geography profession, uh, that's something that we would try and like to, we would like to try and highlight as a message mm -hmm. and see what we can do to help, say, for example, Department for Education um, to see if, if, if there's more that we can perhaps do there. Again, join up efforts, join up expertise across the various government departments. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think joining up is absolutely key. One, one colleague has asked if there were any particular programs you would recommend um, that were easy for staff or students to use, but I think, you perhaps suggested that you don't know of any in particular? 
Uh, not, not really. Again, there are a few different teaching material, teaching resources that are out there offered through a few different agencies. I'd also say that um, Esri and Esri UK have um, have teaching materials. There's learn.arcgis.com um, that has some free materials yeah. there. ArcGIS Online is is really easy to deploy. It's a, it's a tool that I used in my own PhD, uh, just mainly because instead of having to install the GIS and configure it and get around any firewall network issues with regard to actually installing the platform, mm -hmm. you know, you just need a, a web browser and you're yeah, off to the races. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I also recognize that there are other platforms too, like you can use Google Earth, you can use um, you can use Cardo, which is another web GIS. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd say like focus on what might be available via the browser. So that way it saves you from having installed something. Sure, and, and cost as well, of course, is an issue mm. for some for some schools. Can I just ask you, this is my own question, because mm -hmm. I was really intrigued when you're talking about the link with transport and Department of Transport. Mm -hmm. Now, um, do you would you have any input to say the vexed question of HS2 and, and the route? And, and you've got a public and a private partnership there. So mm -hmm. do, do you as the as um as as government geographers have any input or make any contribution perhaps to the the provide private providers a part of that? I mean, is is that on, on a geographer's radar or is it all just in-house in the private sector? I mean, uh, is it is definitely on our radar. Um I can't uh, I'm afraid I can't talk about that too much, not because I not because I can't, but because I don't exactly know. Uh, right. We do have colleagues who are part of um, the geography profession who are in Department for Transportation. And yeah. I know the Department for Transportation, um, you know, they are aware of what's going on in HS2. They are leading with regard to policy. Uh, it's it's not so much that, um, you know, private sector is, is um, it, that private sector is, uh, leading the way necessarily, they are they're doing the analyses and they're doing the groundwork, but it's based on the guidance and decisions that are being that are happening within DFT and supported by our, right. our members across government. So yeah, right. I, I'm sure that that's work that they're aware of yeah. and are leading on. Yeah, yeah. So so overall, I mean, you you seem to have you've achieved so much in two years. I mean, it's extraordinary yeah. that you have all these geographers. It's just, it's almost as if they're kind of busying away and they're just waiting for um, you know, to, to lift the lid and out they've popped out the bottle which is fantastic so mm -hmm. do you think um that having the geography profession has actually dare i say it you know and you don't you don't have to say yes it'd be trying to be as honest ha has it improved decision making oh um it's gaining traction shall right. we say okay okay uh, Mainly because, uh, you know, we, the, the various professions that I mentioned a bit earlier, science, uh, statistics, uh, operational research, social research, and, econ and economics, those four professions have been established within government for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking to do those kinds of analyses as a senior or a policymaker, if you want to do an economic analysis, you get an economist. If you want to do a statistical analysis, you get a statistician. But yeah. they've not really engaged enough with saying, I need to do a geographic analysis as such, I need a geographer. They would say, I need to do a geographic analysis on say, for example, um, the, the economic impacts of the housing market. I'm gonna get an economist where in actuality we can say, well, actually you can get a, you can get a geographer to also feed into that too. Or you might find a geographer who is also an economist, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. because again, we, we recognize sure. that plurality. I'm actually a member of, I'm a, I'm a member of three different professions. I'm a member of the geography profession. I'm also a member of science and engineering, and I'm also a member of um, operational research where I'm looking at improving workflows, uh, having efficiency gains on those workflows. So instead of actually creating a spreadsheet and then taking that spreadsheet and having to manually manipulate it to then produce the geospatial output, mm. I use programming languages to actually streamline that flow to get it from data source to data output in a much faster way so yeah, yeah we, we recognize that people can belong to a number of different professions a number of different mm -hmm. uh, initiatives across government and we want to support that too because again mm -hmm. geography is an interdisciplinary discipline mm -hmm. and we have people doing a variety of different things and we want to support that
Mm. I mean, geographers do think differently to mm. other disciplines, and it's you know it's fundamental that uh, you know we want to get that uh, that kind of co coordination together to make the best possible decisions. But but some of the decisions or the the analysis is probably not very welcome. I mean, I think that I mean, do I do I sense that in some departments there might be a bit of reticence about having a professional geographer in to come and comment or are, there, are, are you are, or are you welcomed with open arms all the way across the system <laughs> uh you know I, I think it's actually more the case that um they don't really know what we can do or what we can <laughs> yeah. offer yeah i think yes it, it comes back to uh you know really unless unless seniors can see what we can do yeah. then they don't know what we can do and there are a number of different ways that we can demonstrate that but what I've found to be quite challenging is that for the various government departments that I've worked at and I've worked with, uh, they often want to see it. And, and weirdly enough, this actually comes back to my PhD research. Again, you could get me to talk about that for quite a while. But um, uh, what I find is that when it, it, will, it really makes an impact when it's put in the right context. So if, for example, I show my seniors in HMCTS, uh, the the system that I created over at MHCLG to serve out spatial data sets on um, indices of deprivation, on house price indices, whatever, even though, you know, in an abstract way of thinking, we could think, you know what, I could take data sets that are associated with courts and do that same thing and serve it out that same way. That mm -hmm. hasn't exactly landed within my department uh, or really made that impact because right. I don't have a tangible product to show them. Now, on the other hand, um, and it's and it's very simplistic, but it is still geospatial. Uh, uh, working with my colleagues in property, uh, one of the things that they find that they struggle with is to capture information around, uh, you know, the maintenance of courts where toilets have been, toilets have broken or light bulbs need to be changed or whatnot. So I did a quick proof of concept using um, ArcGIS Online and Survey One Two Three, where I had a mobile phone app and I quickly created a survey. Uh, said, you know, there's a broken toilet on the third floor. I took a picture of the broken toilet, which, you know, was just a, a mock-up. I just took a picture mm -hmm. of whatever was in the room. And mm -hmm. then I hit send. And then immediately as I hit send, I had my computer up on the big screen and they saw that point come up like that. And then the lights, the, their, their eyes just lit up in the room and they're like, that's how, I can, that's how I can see how I can use that. Sure. And yes, that was just a localized example yeah. for, for a court, but thinking about, I could do that across all my courts across the country. Yeah, yeah. So again, I I, oh, go ahead. So no, sorry, it's interesting because I use that sort of model when I've just given my presidential lecture and I had this model, um, I don't know if you saw a bit of it, but um, there's not knowledge is of the x-axis and perception on the y-axis. And if you want people to engage, you need to improve perception and knowledge. And when you get both together, then you're going to get some understanding of the light bulb moment. And, Absolutely. And that's, and that's what we need. And it sounds like you need it in cross government as well. But I mean, only two years in. So, you know, mm -hmm. well done. And it's amazing. One, one last you. question, if I may. Um, mm -hmm. What about students who are in schools or in the sixth form and they're thinking, um, I, I want to get involved in this in, 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 in job yeah. geography and government. Um, do, do you do apprenticeships in GIS in government or elsewhere? Um, are there any kind of leads you can give to teachers who might be listening? Absolutely. Yes, yes. So we we do have a print we we do have apprenticeship schemes. Uh, again, we piggyback off of these initiatives um, where where they already exist. But within government, we do have apprenticeship schemes. Um, some of those apprenticeships are handled centrally, whereas others are handled by the different professions. Um, but no matter where you come in, if you come in and you've got and if you've got geographic skills or say that you're interested in contributing to the geography profession, it will come to us and we'll be able to connect up with the right opportunities that are there. Uh, also to say that at the um, at the undergraduate level, we also support the government the what's called the sandwich scheme, sandwich program. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then for that, you know, you apply it's students who are within their undergraduate degree and they want a little bit of time out or want to experience yeah. something over the summer, they can apply for that mm -hmm. and they'll be placed again where we're most appropriate. Um, I just recently had a, a student from uh, 
London School of Economics, uh, Jake Alabone Salt. He was a great guy. He helped to contribute towards some uh, more localized travel town analyses. You'll see a little bit of a pattern there. Uh, and it was a great learning experience for him. It gave him uh, something to put on his CV. He had also said that he was interested in potentially joining civil service. So it gave him a little bit of a flavor to see sure. what this is like. So if anybody's interested, you know, definitely get in touch with, get in touch with those, um, the, those schemes, get in touch with me. Uh, I'm happy to share my email address and happy to connect people up. That, that's really kind. So for, for, for teachers listening here, I mean, are there any particular combination of A-level subjects which you think that's a winner? So for instance, maths and geography and uh, another, um, or is it just literally you're a good geographer regardless of what you studied? Uh, well, uh, it, it's, I'd say first and foremost, what you need to get there is is a passion, a passion and interest and enthusiasm in geography. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that definitely helps because um, you know th this is so important. It's it's great. It's wonderful. It's interdisciplinary. It's very wide reaching. But at the same token, there are certain complementary skills that help. Uh, we definitely encourage people to pursue um, training and qualification and uh, courses in STEM. Uh, I think we, you know, we'd even expand it a bit more out to say STEAM as well. Right. Uh, but you know, the, there's there's really a lot to say about mathematics and understanding technology, engineering, uh, but also having a bit of that understanding of um, you know humanities as well. Like a lot of the work that I do, yes, I create a map. I do a lot of technical work, but I also have to write um, briefings and notes that then get delivered to seniors who are not tech experts mm -hmm. and having that understanding of how to communicate mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. in an understandable mm -hmm. way to a variety of audiences mm -hmm. is extremely necessary and also as research has shown is something that tends to be somewhat lacking particularly from tertiary education so you know really having people who can engage who can uh, communicate as well as do the tech stuff is, is yeah. really important. Yeah, it sounds like young people who are applying have got to look back on their education and say, yeah, I've got this particular expertise, but you know what? I've got these other skills, which I've got through my geography training to A level or whatever, to make me more, um, you know, more approachable or I can understand, I can communicate with people, you know, I can, I can, I can think more laterally about things. Uh, and that's a, that's, a real, that's a real winner. Absolutely. Brilliant. Patrick, thank you so much. It's been really interesting. And I can see on the, on your screen, there are, there's a website, LinkedIn and Twitter. So can I encourage everybody who's listening to get tweeting? And, uh, and, and we hope we'll see you at conference next year. It's going to be in Guildford. So it's not too far away from you, I hope. So I hope we see you again then as well. Thank Brilliant. you very thank much indeed. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And thanks for having me. Pleasure.